Okay, we're good to go? Okay. Vince, I'm going to shortchange you. So you, you see Morgan, see how much she had written about you? I don't do this kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, thanks uh, everybody for joining us tonight. This is a pretty sexy subject actually. And uh, I'm Rob McCoy. Uh, I'm the chief cook and bottle washer here at the Atomic Museum. And uh, last fall, uh, we started talking to tonight's guest about maybe doing a spy exhibit. It's pretty sexy to me. And uh, so we got on a Zoom call and started talking about it. And I said, oh, by the way, could you also throw in an Enigma machine if you could? He goes, oh, yeah, we have 16 of them. Well, anyway. Dr. Vince Houghton is uh, the director of the National Security Agency's National Cryptologic Museum. I didn't even know the NSA had such a museum. And uh, so that was news to me, and, and surprisingly and wonderfully so. He's also the former historian and curator of the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., which is a very popular place. And we're still going in and out, and it's okay. As we're good. It's still working. It's just going in and out. And I'm done. Please help me welcome Vince Houghton. All right. I got, yeah. I got the one that might work. So, so. All right, I appreciate that, Rob. Um, we have 16 enigmas that we loan out. We have about 70 in our collection. We're the NSA. I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> of course we do. Uh, speaking of which, the first couple things I need to do are some house cleaning. Uh, one is the presentation you're about to see is completely unclassified. I have to mention that. Uh, it's been reviewed by a pre-publication review at NSA. Uh, any opinion I state, which I might if there's during Q&A, I'm going to try to be factual, but every so often I, I'm an opinionated person, as some of you know. Uh, those opinions are my own, not the opinions of the National Cryptologic Museum, the National Security Agency, the Department of Defense, the National uh, Director of National Intelligence, or the United States government. Did I miss anybody? The Russians. The Russians, not the opinion of the Russians or anyone else. Uh, and then finally, I'm a former professor, and so I'm used to having people ask questions in the middle of lectures and conversations, which I'm perfectly fine with. Uh, we don't have to wait till the end for Q&A. If there's something you don't understand, if there's something you want clarification, go ahead. If, it, if, if I don't want to answer it, if it's too tangential what I'm talking about, I'll say save it for the end. But don't allow me to keep going if you don't understand or if you're just not connecting what I'm talking about. Uh, I have no problem answering questions as we go along. This is a topic that's somewhat complicated. Uh, it's not something that uh, we tend to go to school for. I mean, I did, but I'm very rare, right? Most of us, when you go to a museum in Washington, D.C. or anywhere else, you had a little bit of background about that museum in school, right? So you go to the Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., you learned about dinosaurs and rocks in third grade. You got a little background of the U.S. history, even the Atomic Museum. You learn, you took physics in high school, you have some background of how stuff works. Most people don't take classes on intelligence. Most people don't, certainly don't take classes on cryptography, which is the museum that I, I direct, that's our focus there. Uh, and so there are times when we have to kind of worm our way into this topic and, and try to understand it at a basic level. So that's how we're going to start, assuming this thing works. Oh, it sort of did. Wait, did I go the wrong way? There it is. All right. So we're going to start with a very brief Intel 101, right? What is intelligence? And this is so we're all on the same page as we move forward. Because we're actually going to start talking about things like telemetry intelligence and counterintelligence and some really inside baseball uh, intelligence topics as we want to make sure we're all on the same page. And so there's an old-fashioned way of thinking about the world of intelligence. That's called the intelligence cycle. Anyone heard that term before, intelligence cycle? Well, essentially, it's three big parts that make up what intelligence agencies do. The first part of this is collection. It's exactly what it sounds like. This is gathering up all the data and information from let's say, all over the world. Uh, and there are different types of collection that are, that are primarily done by different agencies. The one that is the most common and the one that is the oldest is human intelligence. That is the purview mostly of the CIA. Uh, that is sending intelligence officers overseas to recruit people with access to information to give us that information. 
that sounds very basic, but here's the spy stuff, right? This is where we're trying to recruit some engineer who works on the Russian missile program to give us top secret information about the Russian missile program or Iran or any of our other potential adversaries out there. This is the oldest type of intelligence that there is. Uh, we joked at the International Spy Museum that espionage, which is what we're talking about here, is the second oldest profession, and in many cases less moral and ethical than the first <laughs> this profession. Uh, you know, this is what you think of when you think of spying, is human intelligence. It's the sexy part, but it's not necessarily the most important part. Don't tell the CIA, they think they're more important than everybody else. Uh, but they, they, there's a small part of what we do as an intelligence community comes from human intelligence. The bigger chunk comes from this next one, signals intelligence. It's not just because I work for the National Security Agency, I'm certainly not a shill for my agency, but signals intelligence is a humongous collection mechanism for not only the United States, but every country around the world. It's about communications intelligence. It's about bringing in information from intercepting communications. We send trillions of messages a day. And all these intelligence agencies are trying to get in the middle of those messages being sent. to try to gather this kind of information. NSA does this, but so do other agencies. Part of signals intelligence include things like ELINT, which is electronics intelligence. That's not up there. This is basically trying to gather information from electromagnetic radiation. So for instance, you might have a building in the middle of nowhere in some country that we don't really get along with. And they claim that building's just a standard office building, but there's a ridiculous amount of radiation. I don't mean like gamma or alpha, I mean like radio waves and other things coming out of that building. And we're like, that's, that's not a data center. That is something nefarious that we want to pay attention to. Another part of SIGIN is telemetry intelligence or telint, which I'll talk about later on, because that is the crux of this exhibit that we have here as well. That's gathering information from telemetry of missiles, satellites, spacecraft, the kind of things that are part of a bigger umbrella of signals intelligence. Then massive measurements and signatures intelligence. This is something that the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA at the Pentagon, is the primary mover and shaker of massant. This is things on the far reaches of the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm talking about like spectroscopy, seismology. How do we detect underground nuclear tests coming out of North Korea? Well, we use seismographs, the same way we detect earthquakes. But we have them at a point where they're so they're so uh, sensitive that they can pick up these minute vibrations in the Earth's crust and we're able to say, hey, something weird just happened. It was either a really big earthquake or the North Koreans just detonated another nuclear weapon. Same idea with spectroscopy on the other end of the spectrum of saying, okay, how do we figure out what the weapon was? How do we figure out how powerful it was, what it was made of? Well, even if you have something way underground as if you walk down the street a little bit, you see these radiation, the community radiation, what the hell are they called? The C, yeah, the community, community radiation uh, monitors that pick up background radiation and radiation from the area. Well, this is picking up minute little pieces of radiation at that point. We're doing the same thing to pick up fission byproducts, or in some cases, fusion byproducts of underground nuclear tests. That's what Masson is doing. Then you have things like GEOINT, Geospatial Intelligence. This is what the NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency are doing. Old-fashioned photographs and interpreting photographs, but usually from space, right? So we're talking about satellites, we're talking about spy planes, we're talking about uh, drones, the ability to interpret photographs, or in some cases digital photographs, or in some cases things that are not just visual, but we're talking about UV, we're talking about IR, we're talking about things that are beyond the range of human vision and human eyes. That's the collection stuff. So it's bringing in data, it's bringing in information. It's not intelligence, right? No one who does collection will agree with this because they all think they're the most important people in the world, but collectors do not gather intelligence. They collect information, they collect data. It's just stuff. It's the eggheads, it's the analysts that turn it into intelligence. These are the PhDs, these are the people who are whiter than transparent because they never see the light of day. These are the guys who have the real inferiority complex of the CIA cafeteria because all the paramilitary and operation guys make fun of them. They're the ones who make history because they make intelligence. They take this raw data, in some cases, thousands of pages of raw data and figure out what it means, figure out why it matters, figure out what's important, right? We, there's a term called 
taking the signals and separating them from the noise. Right? The idea of trying to figure out what is important, what is actionable, what makes us safer with all the information out there. How do we pull out the stuff that matters? That's what the analysts do. And then finally, I would argue the hardest part of the intelligence cycle is dissemination. This is making it understandable for decision makers. Meaning Congress, meaning generals in the military, the president. Not a single one of them right now of people in position of power have high level technical training. Maybe some generals do, but a lot of people like General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, is not a technical specialist. Certainly, Presidents Biden, all going all the way back to President Reagan, had no technical specialty. Anyone know the last, really the only, technical president that we had with a strong technical degree? Carter. Jimmy Carter, he was a nuclear engineer, right? So he, he kind of understood nuclear intelligence better than most. But most presidents, most chiefs of staff, high-level people, most speakers of the House, the people that are making decisions about American national security don't know the first thing about, let's say, Iran's nuclear program, or the first thing about Chinese spy balloons, or the first thing about high-level intelligence, either technical or even non-technical. So how do you give them information that allows them to make decisions based on this intelligence that you've collected? It is an art form of dumbing it down, for lack of a better phrase, making it shiny and bullet pointed in one page so that members of Congress, that presidents and others can understand this. Sometimes making it in pictures. Ronald Reagan loved being presented almost like movie, like moving pictures, like they would make him a video of his pres for his presidential daily brief every morning. Barack Obama loved having it on an iPad where he could have links to the raw data and the raw intelligence. Clinton was similar to that, although they didn't have iPads at that point. He would just ask question after question. So finally, they just brought him the raw intelligence, and he did a lot of the analysis for himself. I won't make a Trump joke here. I don't know who was in front of me. You know, the crayons, whatever you want to say. Uh, everyone had their different style about the way they took this stuff, but the idea was that the people who did the briefings had to understand what made that person tick, understand how that person took in information. So when you're presenting something, you're saying, Iran has reached X percentage enrichment. 99% of Congress is gonna go, huh? That sounds bad. You're like, it's not, right? When you talk about 90%, then we start freaking out, right? When they reach 18%, this is why you shouldn't worry yet. We should be paying attention to it. So those are the kind of things that dissemination of intelligence, and that's why it's so difficult. Then finally, counterintelligence. This is the flip side of everything. Every country on Earth, it's trying to steal information from every other country on Earth. Every country has their own intelligence services. And in every country on Earth, that's illegal. Espionage is illegal everywhere. There's no country where it's not against the law to walk in and try to steal information. So everyone needs to have counterintelligence, including the United States. The FBI is the primary agency responsible for counterintelligence, although every agency does it. In fact, the Department of Energy has one of the most robust counterintelligence operations of many of different organizations. Yes, sir? The FBI's mandate for counterintelligence exceeds what? So it does and it doesn't. So basically, it really depends on if they're being invited by others to be involved. So for instance, we have an agreement called the Five Eyes Agreement, which is uh, the five English-speaking countries, the United States, Canada, the UK, New Zealand, and Australia, are the closest intelligence sharers. This agreement goes back to World War II. And there are times when you have what's called the legat, the legislative attache at an embassy, usually an FBI agent, and that, that can help and advise, in, uh, sometimes even more than that, counterintelligence investigations. But for the most part, the FBI is working domestic counterintelligence, trying to catch Russian spies in the United States. Uh, the same idea with the DOE CI people. I'm going to use CI for counterintelligence. You're trying to grab people who are infiltrating Los Alamos or you know, Hanford or any of the other places to try to stop them from stealing our information. Does that make sense? All right. I'll look. There we go. OK. So counterintelligence is sometimes very much confused with law enforcement. Yes, it's the FBI, in many cases, running counterintelligence. But counterintelligence and law enforcement have very different purposes. 
in mind, right? The FBI side of law enforcement, the guys who chase bank robbers, the guys who are going after financial crimes or forgers or anything else, their job is to collect information, evidence, in order to prosecute somebody and send them to prison. Now, sometimes that's the ultimate goal with counterintelligence also, but not necessarily the primary goal. So when the FBI is on to someone who might be a Russian spy or on to somebody who works for the United States and may be passing information to the bad guys, they may not swoop in and grab them right away. And even if they have evidence to put them in jail, they may wait, they may watch, they may try to see who they're connecting with, to try to move their way up. Because what you want to finally get to is the guy running the whole operation. Because you find the guy running the operation, then you're finding all his other spies and people that he's recruited to work for him. So we don't always swoop in and arrest people the minute we find out that they're spying. In a lot of cases, we will let them go. We will follow them around. We will see what connections we can make. Because especially in the digital age, we can figure out everywhere they went, everyone they've talked to. That's where other agencies come into play sometimes when you're talking about counterintelligence. So it's very different. Now, it's also different because the FBI is not the only organization doing counterintelligence. In some cases, you have like DOE, right? DOE has no capability of arresting you, right? They'll, they can call the FBI in, but if they find someone who is potentially has infiltrated one of these nuclear weapons facilities or, or labs, they're gonna call the FBI, but probably in conjunction with the FBI, they're gonna say, let's, let's see what this guy's doing, who this guy's reporting to. So it's not just the fact of watching them walk out the door with classified information. It's trying to figure out who wants this stuff. Why do they want this stuff? And the perfect scenario is you grab them and instead of sending them to trial in prison, you flip them. You create what we call a double agent where they're feeding bad information or disinformation back to our adversaries. Some of the double agent operations in history are fascinating to read about. The, the most impressive one is the British Double Cross system or the 20 Commission, XX, that's why they call it the Double Cross or 20 Commission during World War II where every single Nazi agent was flipped by MI5 during the war, every single one. So they were in a position where they were feeding garbage information back to the Germans the entire war. And this garbage information helped them win battles, it helped them win, set up for Normandy because they were kicking back this information that the invasion wasn't gonna be Normandy, it was gonna be at Calais. They were sending back information using these German spies that they did, they said, look, you have two options. One, we could shoot you, or two, you could work for us. Now, we don't necessarily give them those options today. We say, one, you can go to prison, or two, you can work for us, but there's a way that we can pass information to the bad guys that we want them to have, not that they want to have, that, that helps us moving forward. Uh, we don't do this as much, uh, mainly because it gets really messy after a while. You, you basically have no possible way to prosecute somebody if they screw you over after that, because our criminal justice system has, is designed to protect people who, um, you know, to protect, to protect your constitutional rights. And at that point, you've kind of twisted them into circles. Uh, and all, you know, not necessarily a negative way, it's just you're putting yourself in a position where you don't necessarily have the chain of evidence that you want for a straightforward trial. Uh, the best of the best more recently are the Cubans. Uh, from 1964 to 1985, not a single person we thought was working for us inside Cuba was actually working for us inside Cuba. Every one of them was doubled back against the United States, passing as garbage information and, and nonsense, uh, infiltrating the Cuban exile community and everything else. Uh, there's, there's people who are very, very good at this. Our goal has always been to secure our information, to protect so that other people don't have it. We are always a target of other countries because of our technological capabilities, because of the kind of money and, and, and weapon systems that are more advanced than most everyone else. Uh, so it's more in our, our benefit just to stop them from stealing our information versus playing games. Uh, but in many cases, the games we play are kind of seeing if they can lead us back to the top dog so that we can connect the dots to other people that might be working for him. I think your question was getting at something very interesting because there is an offense-defense relationship when it comes to counterintelligence. And so that last bullet point also, the best way to catch a spy is our own spies. So organizations like CIA 
have their own office of counterintelligence. Their job is not to catch Russian spies in the United States. Their job is actually to infiltrate Russian intelligence so they can find out who Russia sent over here to spy on us. So in many cases, we get the most effective information about who is here trying to steal our information from our people infiltrating other countries, finding out their information, and vice versa as well. Right? We were very bad in the early Cold War of infiltrating the Soviets, not because the KGB was so good at stopping us. They were, but not that good. It was because they had spies here that were passing information about who we were sending over and trying to recruit. Kim Philby is an example, the Cambridge Five. You may have heard of them. These were people recruited in Britain back in the 1930s when they were kids at Cambridge who eventually rose to high levels within British intelligence. Kim Philby was the deputy director of MI5. So basically, like, think of like the assistant director of the FBI it was a Soviet spy, but the British version. He knew everything that we were trying to do against the Soviets, and he just sent it back to the Soviet Union, to the KGB. So we couldn't infiltrate anybody, because the minute we sent somebody in, I mean, this is like James Bond stuff, right? These are Bulgarians who are parachuting in in the middle of the night with a cache of weapons, getting all ready, all camouflage, and the minute they hit the ground, the lights come on and they're arrested by the KGB. Like, why, is this our luck this bad? No, because literally their spies were passing information about our spies. So that's one of the things that we try to do. It's not just infiltrating the, the Soviets or the Russians or whomever else to find out information about their technology or their intentions. It's also trying to find out about their spies so we can protect ourselves there as well. Too much counterintelligence can actually be a bad thing. Now, this sounds like almost like a truism where too much paranoia causes real problems, and we can certainly see that in classification and overclassification. We can certainly see that in security clearance issues. Uh, it took me a year to get cleared. Um, I'm not a bad person, but I had done a lot of things, not bad things, but working at the spy museum, I had gone to Moscow, I had gone to Cuba, I knew former terrorists, I knew former spies. I kind of felt bad for the security and counterintelligence people at NSA because they're like, you did what to who? I'm like, oh yeah, I know, I know this guy, he used to be on Al-Qaeda, and I'm like, um, But sometimes we run into issues where things are overclassified, or people don't get clearance they should get, or people get clearance they shouldn't. But also you run into situations where classification or secrecy actually helps our adversaries figure out what's important to us. Now think about that for a second. If I tell you you can't know something because it's secret, immediately you go, ooh, that's something important. Right? Or if there's a black hole somewhere on Google Maps, right? try, try typing in certain areas in the United States that, you know, that we know for a fact may have interesting things in them, and they're, they're pixelated. That tells our adversaries a lot, that there's something really important there. Now, that you have to do it because you don't want them to see what's actually being pixelated, but at the same time, the lack of information is, is providing information. So there's a balance. And the reason I'm bringing that up is the balance is going to be an interesting concept that we see in the Manhattan Project and the decisions that they had to make in order to not let the whole world know what we were doing. So let's move on to that concept. Please, for the love of God, work. Okay. Nope. Oh, this is Alex taking control. So this is the front gate of Los Alamos when, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, so I'm, I'm coming from the Intel side, not necessarily the nuke side. Um, all right, there's that one. All right, there it is, okay. So when we talk specifically about the kind of information we want to focus here at the Atomic Museum at things like Manhattan Project counterintelligence. This is something that a lot of historians study to try to understand how to do counterintelligence in a massive, humongous project. Because Manhattan Project, we think of as it was Los Alamos and maybe some other stuff. This was a massive, huge undertaking. An undertaking that no country had ever tried before, and certainly not the United States. Leslie Groves, who was head of the Manhattan Project, built the Pentagon prior to working on the Manhattan, the world's largest office building, and said that was a drop in the bucket compared to how much, how many moving parts and how much 
how many resources, how many different people you had to juggle to work on a bomb project that no one knew was gonna work. No one had any idea if you're gonna pull this off and you're spending billions of dollars. I mean, that's $2 billion in 1940s dollars. That's how much the Manhattan Project cost. So we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars today for a program that no one knew was gonna work until the very last second, until literally the test at Trinity showed that it worked. But this is a program that had to be protected at every level. This wasn't just a question of, you know, we have to protect what type of material we're gonna use or the most important scientists. We had to protect every single possible thing coming out of the Manhattan Project. No other country could know that we were working on this atomic weapon. Because the fear was that if they knew we were working on an atomic bomb, they would double or re-triple or triple their efforts. And of course, the Germans were the ones we were most worried about. The idea behind counterintelligence for the Manhattan Project was that the Germans were ahead of us. That's what everyone assumed, certainly in 1942 and 1943. They didn't know we had a program going at all, but if they found out that we did, they would kick it in the hyperdrive and they would beat us and they'd win the war, Hitler with the bomb. Hitler never had a bomb, they never successfully tested a bomb, they never got close to successfully testing a bomb, anyone who says otherwise is a crank, but, but we didn't know that. We had no idea that the Germans were basically giving up on their bomb uh, project, on their ability to try to create a nuclear weapon by the end of the war, so we were worried that if they heard any information about us trying to develop a nuclear weapon, they would all of a sudden give all the resources toward building one of their own, and that would be really problematic. So you didn't just protect what's at Los Alamos, you had to protect everything. And by everything, we're talking about things all over the country. Right? The, the scale of the Manhattan Project is massive. You're talking, of course, about Hanford and Washington, Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, but also all these little university labs, whether it was in Chicago or at Berkeley or around the country, that all had elements of the Manhattan Project. Every single one of those needed to be protected. Every single one of those needed to make sure that there was no one there shouldn't be who was working there. And then you factor in the fact that the personnel were not all American, right? You're not getting the clearance that I have at NSA unless you're an American citizen. Forget it. You're not getting clearance even close to what I have today unless you're an American citizen. But in 19, the 1930s, you have hundreds of foreign scientists coming to the United States, all running away from the Nazis. And at this point, you can't clear them all, right? You, you're not gonna, you can't nationalize them all either, or naturalize them all either. So you have Italians, you have some Russians, you have people who are from all over the world working on the most secret American project, and you do the best that you can to make sure they're not spies, but you can only go so far. And you actually have to turn away from some of the natural ways that you would say this person shouldn't be cleared. What was even before the Cold War, what was the number one thing that would keep somebody from getting security clearance in the 1930s and early 1940s? It was membership in what? I think I heard communists, and you're right. right? Any membership in the Communist Party, any kind of what they call fellow travelers, so if you had friends, if you had lovers, if you had people you knew, if you hung around with lefties in college, if you went to school and did any kind of union marches or anti-labor, you know, poor labor, anti-management stuff, good luck, right, prior to the World War II getting a job in the highest levels of American government. Well, what do you think? Scientists tend to be lefties, especially European scientists, right? And a lot of them had close ties to American communism or to European communism. Robert Oppenheimer's ex-girlfriend was a card-carrying communist. And you're all gonna watch the movie and you know, just to see what they do with Jean Tatlock, but she was like membership card, you know, like you have your Costco card, she had her commie card, right? And that was Robin Oppenheimer's girlfriend, his mistress, I guess, technically, since he was married to Kitty at the time. When the American counterintelligence crew looked at that, they, they went and they said, this is problematic, right? When they went to Leslie Groves and said, I, this Oppenheimer guy's got really close ties to some people who have very, very close ties to the Soviets. And at that point, Leslie Grove said, we gotta have them, right? We don't have a choice, we have to suck it up. But there are entire big boxes in the National Archives full of file folders that people rejected from working on the Manhattan Project because they had close ties with communism. 
close ties with people who sort of could possibly have ties with communism, right? You're left of center, right? You may actually go on a march for workers' rights. All of a sudden, you're a commie, right? You just couldn't do that. But these foreign scientists, it was very difficult to vet them. That's how we get Klaus Fuchs. That's how we get Alan Nunn May. That's how we get Julius Rosenberg and David Greenglass. It happens. But if you think about the fact that tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people worked on the Manhattan Project on all the little different aspects of manufacturing and logistics and everything else, and we count maybe 30, 35 bad guys, all Soviet, it's not bad, right? I mean, everyone focuses on what they stole and the fact that you know, this was like the secret they got out. We could argue that all day long. I don't really agree with that. But even if you said they stole a bunch of stuff, fine. But that was a very small percentage. So they did pretty well in the kind of massive project they had to deal with. The biggest problem they run into is science is not something that you can nationalize. You can try to keep it secret. But basically, Glenn Seaborg, who was the first head of the Atomic Energy Commission, and actually he was the one who discovered plutonium, worked on the Manhattan Project, and he was asked, like, what do you think of all the secrecy? What do you think of all the counterintelligence? He goes, look, the only secret of the atomic bomb was whether it would work or not. And at Trinity and Hiroshima, we showed the world that it did. And at that point, anyone with a, basically a sophomore or junior in college level physics background can figure out kind of how it worked. And so at that point, you really can't protect this kind of information, right? You, you showed it off, right? You dropped two bombs on Japan. Everyone knows that this stuff works. At this point, secrecy really doesn't matter as much, although everyone still thinks it does, right? Everyone's still scrambling to say, oh my god, we have to stop them from getting information. What about the thermonuclear weapons, right? What about hydrogen weapons? They were thinking about that before even atomic bombs, right? I mean, this is Edward Teller going back before they built the atomic bomb was already thinking about, hey, look, we could do a fusion weapon with this. And people are like, shh, don't say that. And he's like, the sun, man. Everyone knows how the sun works, right? The sun is not a secret, right? The sun takes small little atoms and smushes them together. That's not an American secret, right? That's the kind of crazy part about doing counterintelligence when it comes to science is science is international, it's universal, it's something that you don't just, have. there's no American science, right? There's nothing that you can do to say, we can make sure no one finds out about this. It's guaranteed to happen naturally on its own. I have to do this every time. Yeah, Yahtzee, okay. So there was a solution to this humongous problem. <laughs> and the solution was essentially scorched earth. They, they went and they decided to do a 100% shut the program down to the outside world solution. They encoded all sorts of things, and this was, we kind of laugh, you know, we are the code guys at NSA, so we kind of chuckle at kind of the haphazardry of the codes from the Manhattan Project. I mean, the name of the, the project itself code name. It's, it's intended to try to throw off adversaries figuring out what people are trying to do. The Manhattan Engineer District has nothing to do with New Mexico or Oak Ridge or Hanford or nuclear weapons. It's, it's a way to try to throw off people trying to find out what's going on here. You also have, they didn't call it a bomb, they called it a gadget because they never knew who was listening in. Code names for people, for individuals. Uh, this was certainly true when we were doing intelligence about other countries. No one came right out and said Werner Heisenberg in any kind of messages. His name was Christopher. His code name was Christopher. So when you see OSS messages about German atomic development, going back to people like Oppenheimer and Groves and others, there's never a Heisenberg. It's always Christopher or someone like it because you don't want a name like Heisenberg to show up because guaranteed, if somebody sees that, they know exactly what you're working on, right? Because he's not, Heisenberg's not working on a tank development, no, he's doing some quantum mechanics, something physics, something nuclear. So they even went to that point. And of course, things like Fat Man and Little Boy and all the other things that all code names in order to keep something secret. But they went a step beyond that. And part of what makes the Manhattan Project interesting for business leaders, so there's a lot of business schools that actually study what Leslie Groves did in the Manhattan Project, because he took control of this humongous, massive project as a colonel. 
everyone that says General Leslie Grove, well, he was made a general because he told them he had to be made a general in order for the scientists to respect him. He was Colonel Gross when he got the job. And he went to George Marshall, who was the commander in chief of the army, and said, hey, look, these scientists are, he said some bad things about them. He, you know, uh, I won't repeat them. And he looked, they're, they're, they're pansy whatevers. They're not going to respect me if I'm Colonel Gross. You have to make me a general. So a brand new one-star general is given, essentially in what amounts to, in today's money, about a trillion dollars, and about 100,000 people working under him, and he's building the most important invention in human history. And he says, you know what? All of this is going to be under my control. I'm going to consolidate all the power. I'm not going to allow anyone else to make any decisions. I'm going to be in control of all both counterintelligence and intelligence from the Manhattan Project. He was, by General Marshall, put in charge of all intelligence that had already been gathered by the Navy, the Army, and the OSS. So basically what, what Groves did was he was put in power over two different two-star generals, one well, an admiral, and then the most decorated soldier in American history, Bill Donovan, who was the head of the OSS, who was also a two-star general, who was the only guy in the history of America to win all four of the top awards from the Medal of Honor all the way down to the Bronze Star. And this brand new, like, the stars were still shiny on his shoulder. It was right out of the box. One star general goes in there and says, you work for me now. This is insane, right? The fact that he did this with this confidence, and I don't know if they're going to show this, uh, in, in the Oppenheimer movie coming out, but the chutzpah, as, as my, my, my friend's parents would say back in Miami, the chutzpah of the cojones, as my other friends in Miami would say, uh, of this guy walking in and talking to some of the most de decorated and powerful men in America and saying, you work for me now when it comes to nuclear intelligence, is extraordinary. And I guess I rewarded him, and I didn't do this as a slide. Five years ago, I gave a talk at, here um, where... It was about Groves and everything else, and, and I said that he doesn't get a lot of credit for what he did, but the one thing positive about it was the one movie they made, Fat Man and Little Boy, about the Manhattan Project. Paul Newman played Leslie Groves, so that was like his one like beyond the grave great thing they gave him, because if you've never seen Leslie Groves, that's fine, he doesn't look like Paul Newman. <laughs> now they've doubled it up, now they've got Matt Damon playing Leslie Groves. So this, Leslie Groves looked like if you took the Pillsbury Doughboy and put a big bushy mustache on it, that's Leslie Groves. And so now he's got the guy who played Jason Bourne and then Cool Hand Luke uh, playing him in the movie. So he's, posthumously he's gotten some respect. But the kind of power he wielded over this project is unheard of. Certainly, they're talking about the Department of Defense here, or Department of War at the time. Everything is chain of command. Everything is know your place, but Groves didn't care. He realized what they were doing. He realized the importance of what they were doing, and so he took complete power over the project. So no information got out that he didn't decide to release. No, inf no one got in that he didn't decide should be brought into the program. So he was able to control everything. What this allowed him to do was to give a quarantine on information. Now, anyone have a science background in this room? A couple of you do. That's not the way you do science. Right? Siloing information, quarantining information, uh, compartmentalization is a really stupid way of doing science. Groves did this and he was able to pull it off for one reason and one reason only. Robert Oppenheimer. There's no way this program works the way Groves set it up from a security and counterintelligence perspective without somebody like Oppenheimer. Because each of the labs were doing their own thing. Even people like Enrico Fermi didn't know what everybody else was doing. People like Szilard, people like Robert Serber, who writes the Los Alamos Primer, basically kind of like the Los Alamos 101 for every new scientist that went there, didn't know what everybody else was doing. There was one guy who did, and that was Oppenheimer. And what Oppenheimer brought to the table wasn't super genius, right? He's not, he never won a Nobel Prize. He never really did anything that was groundbreaking to the point where there's some big theory named after him. He's not a Stephen Hawking, he's not a Richard Feynman or an Einstein. What made him better than all those people is that he knew a lot about a lot of things. He was the kind of person that could walk into a room, never having heard your theory before, you could explain it to him in 20 minutes, he'd be like, okay, I understand what you're doing. Here's how it fits in with that, and here's how it fits in with that. And that was not something that anyone else could do. Most scientists are very tunnel vision, they're very siloed in their own world, right? You don't, 
And that's one of the troubles with, with scientific intelligence is that you want to go in and pull some information about somebody's nuclear weapons program or somebody's chemical weapons program or whatever else, you need to send a physicist in or you need to send a chemist in. You can't just send a scientist in, like general science, because everything is very specific. Everything is very much, uh, you get your PhD in quantum mechanics. It's, you're not even just a physicist, you're a quantum mechanics guy. Oppenheimer had the ability to supersede that. He had the ability to go above and beyond and understand what everybody else was doing. If Groves didn't have that, the Groves Counterintelligence Security Program would have doomed the Manhattan Project. Because the silo, the silos people were in did not allow for any kind of conversation. That compartmentalization was great for counterintelligence. It was terrible for science. So we pull it off because you had someone like, like, like that person, uh, someone like Oppenheimer to kind of link the dots and bring everything together. Our, Ironically, the only other person who had full access to the entire Manhattan Project from sheet of shining sea, you know, could go to Hanford, could go to Oak Ridge, everything else, was a man named George Koval. Anyone heard that name before? So George Koval was uh, the health and safety officer for the Manhattan Project, which meant he could go in any lab that he wanted to, he could check up to make sure, kind of think of an OSHA, the OSHA didn't exist at the time, but think of kind of like the OSHA guy who was going in and making sure everybody was doing everything they were supposed to do when it came to safety. And so he flew to Oak Ridge, he flew to, to Hanford, looked at the plants and other things, looked with outside Elmos and checked in, and everyone knew him, and everyone kind of just ignored him when he walked in. He was like, oh, it's a safety guy, just pretend that you're doing what you're supposed to. So he had access to everything. Anyone know why this is a problem other than Jordan? Well, in 2002, George Koval was given the Order of the Red Banner by Vladimir Putin for excellence in espionage during the Second World War. He was a spook. He was actually the one trained intelligence officer that was sent in to infiltrate the Manhattan Project. He worked for the GRU, which is, which is Soviet, now Russian, military intelligence. They got a bad rap because they've been really stupid lately. Uh, in Ukraine, but they were really good back then, and this was a great example of somebody who had access to everything during that time. How did we miss it? Well, because he was what we kind of call a sleeper. He was sent in when he was very young. He had no accent. He had an American education, even though he'd already had a Soviet education. That's what made him kind of stand out that this guy's a genius. You know, he, he went to undergrad and was like the smartest student because he already had an electrical engineering degree. And so it's one of these things where imagine doing your degree twice and how good you'd be the second time going through it. Well, he stood out and he was recruited in the Manhattan Project and the rest is history. Uh, but that's the only other person really that had full access to the gamut of what was going on there. So compartmentalization only works because you have someone like Oppenheimer or, or Koval. <laughs> uh, that was the wrong one. I went the wrong direction. Like, can I get it to go in the right direction? Solution. We had that. Okay. There it is. All right. So the other issue we run into, as we already hinted at before, is can we go too far with security and counterintelligence? And the answer is absolutely. And this almost happens. In fact, if the Germans were paying more attention to what was going on in American science, they would have known we were working on a bomb. In fact, the Soviets, figured it out because of how much we clamped down on American science moving into the Second World War. So in the basic sense, intelligence doesn't have to be information, it has to be lack of information. Lack of information can tell us a lot about what's going on. We actually, there's a, there's a part of intelligence called traffic analysis. And traffic analysis is a way that even if we can't intercept communications, knowing like where they're coming from or where they're not coming from, we can kind of track things and trace things. It's complicated, I won't get in it. But the idea is lack of information can tell us a lot. In this case, lack of information told the Soviets a lot. Thank God it didn't tell the Germans a lot, but the Soviets were paying attention. And they noticed that in 1941, people like Oppenheimer and Fermi and the other top scientists were publishing articles like they had for the last 20 years in journals like Nature and Science and all these other ones, and they were teaching classes, right? Oppenheimer taught a very popular class at the University of California at Berkeley. Fairman was teaching at the University of Chicago. All the top scientists were teaching classes, writing papers. In 1942, about half of them stopped. 
But it was still, there was still some stuff coming out because the Manhattan Project doesn't kick off under Groves until basically the end of 42, beginning of 43, when it all ends completely. You can look at this. If you look at old, you can actually go online. If you go to the, Nature is like the premier science uh, journal for, especially for physicists. You can look at the, the table of contents of who's publishing what. And it goes from, in 41 and 42, a who's who of American science, right? It's, if you look at the last like 10 elements on the periodic table, they're all named after the people who are publishing, right? Rutherfordium and Fermium and all these others. 1943, it's like Bob Jones, you know, like basically anyone, like I, any one of you could have written something that would end up in nature because no scientist of any kind of worth was publishing anything because all of them had been shut down. It wasn't a decision they made independently, it was a growth. This is the whole idea of information lockdown. So no new scientific journal articles from anyone of any consequence. They just stopped teaching their classes. So there was no Robert Oppenheimer professor class at the University of California, Berkeley. Fermi wasn't teaching his class in Chicago. None of the other ones were teaching the class anywhere. It's like an associate assistant adjunct professor doing the class there. So it wasn't hard for the Soviets to take one look at this and say, hey, all of them have gone somewhere. They didn't just vanish, they've all gone somewhere. And then it, the next step would be, well, where did they go? Well, there are all these train tickets they could easily track to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And these hotel rooms around the train station, Santa Fe, New Mexico, where everyone had the same name. Because the counterintelligence guys weren't particularly good at this, and so they said, go check in under this name, and they told everybody the same name. And so when they started checking in, they're like, oh, another one of you. Like, what do you mean another one? Like, we already have 12 Bob Smiths here at the, and they all have Italian accents and German accents, and it's really weird for Bob Smith to be talking like he's from Brandenburg and not in Boise. Uh, what's ironic is they make the same mistake again in the 1960s with all the Apollo astronauts. In the, because they sent them all to training and they all went to the same hotel and they gave them all the same name to check in with. They would have thought they would have learned the first time. But all of this is easily trackable by the KGB, which is very, very good at what they do. And so they know there's something going on, which allows them to target it, which allows them to start recruiting people and figuring out ways to get people inside the Manhattan Project. Very few people were actually recruited once they had started at the Manhattan Project. They were sent in. They were, they were essentially what we call moles. You know, that's the way the Soviets were able to push people into this program to find out what they were doing. It's because they knew where to look, because we over security, it's not a word, but I just made it up, uh, our ability to, to, to stop information from getting out was a huge clue to them moving forward. And then this is something we call open source. That's OSINT, I just want to talk about that. And then something called mirror imaging. This is an analytical bias that we run into all the time that we do just kind of naturally, where we assume that everyone is gonna do things the way we're gonna do things. Now, what I mean by that, we look at other countries and we say, hey look, we developed our X, Y, and Z this way. We developed our nuclear weapons this way. Let's use that as an example. They're gonna do it exactly the same way we are not realizing there's a different culture, there's a different attitude toward safety, there's a different attitude toward labor, there's a different attitude toward what is the uh, maximum allowable radiation exposure that people can have. All these things are very different other places, but we are in a position where we assumed everyone was gonna do it the same way we were. This happens all the time, right? You know, mirror imaging is one of the most common cognitive biases that our analysts working in the intelligence community have to constantly like kind of slap themselves and say, stop mirror imaging. Stop assuming everyone's gonna do things the way we're gonna do things. It was especially the case in the war on terror because we're like, well, how's Al Qaeda gonna react? Well, I would react this way. Okay, well, you work for the CIA, you're not a terrorist in the Middle East who doesn't work for a government. And it, my point though is one of the things we ran into and one of the problems we ran into was that we mirror imaged other countries and how they were building their systems and designing their nuclear programs. And we assume they had them very similar to us. The, 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 I know that sounds very general. Here's the specific example. Guess who wasn't censoring their academic journals 
and wasn't stopping their professor from teaching classes, the Germans, right? So people went like, look, Heisenberg is publishing, right? These, th he's publishing articles about nucle nuclear power and about atomic power. Like, what is going on here? Clearly they're not working on an atomic bomb because they're publishing articles. Now, Groves is actually the only one that didn't fall into this trap, and he did the worst thing he could possibly do is he overcompensated against mirror imaging and said, well, they're only publishing because they want us to think that they're not building a bomb and try to mess with us. And the, so the, the intelligence guys were like, no, dude, <laughs> stop, right? They're, he's, Oppenheimer has told us that Heisenberg is the guy. Not just Oppenheimer, everybody has told us that the German program will be run by, by, by Heisenberg. He's not doing anything. He's publishing articles. He's teaching classes. There's no German program. And you hear this all, that's what they want you to think, right? They're messing with our heads. Like, you're a little, a little paranoid, Leslie Gross, but that's okay, that was his job. So mirror imaging in this case caused undue fear, but in the end, it was because we thought the Germans would do it exactly the way that we did. Okay, the last thing here we're gonna talk about is, my neck of the woods, is the fun-coded communications that were part of the Manhattan Project. Now, let me be very clear. None of these were planned. These were not attempts to develop a cipher system for the Manhattan Project. These were not part of any attempt to create a formalized coded communication. This is just stuff made up on the fly. But they're fun, they're kind of goofy, right? So the first one comes from the, the successful testing of the Chicago pile, known as CP1, which was in 1942, the University of Chicago, Enrico Fermi's team created a self-sustaining controlled chain reaction. Very first ever atomic reaction. So the first atomic reactor was created. And Conant and Con, uh, these are, uh, Conant was the head of Harvard University, but also was part of the Defense Research Board. Uh, and James, um, sorry, Arthur Compton was the head of the University of Chicago. So basically he picks up the phone and is gonna go, we did it, and said, I can't say we did it over the phone, because everyone's listening to the phone. So he's like, um, the Italian navigator, Enrico Fermi, has landed in the New World. And, and after a pause of a couple of seconds, Conant, who was at Harvard in Boston, was like, what? And then realized what was being said. It and how are the natives? So did you blow up University of Chicago? And he said, very friendly. We didn't blow up University of Chicago. That was the way the first announcement of the first self-sending chain reaction was communicated on the phone using a very, very uh, ad hoc coded system. Robert Oppenheimer wanted to make sure, I mean, when he went off the work the morning that the Trinity test took place, or the day before, since it was overnight they were there, his wife Kitty was obviously realizing how nervous Oppenheimer was, realizing how much hard they had worked over the last several years. Kitty wasn't clear. She was not somebody who actually could be at the Trinity test. She was back at home. So when Trinity worked, Robert Oppenheimer asked one of his uh, aides to call and basically said, tell Kitty, tell her, she can change the sheets. That was, his, that was the only thing he could think of at the time, like the prearranged, it was no prearranged code. This was like, she'll get it, she'll understand that this means it worked. Um, but some of my favorite ones are from, um, these were conversations that were long distance communications. So you really had to make sure that you were enciphering it in a way that wasn't going to get picked up. So this was when, uh, the top leaders of each of the countries fighting on the Allied side were meeting toward the very end of the war. Truman had just become president, his FDR had died, and right after Trinity, so he'd only been president for a couple months, right after Trinity, you wanted to get information to him because the idea was to get Stalin to come in on the side of the Allies against the Japanese, and Truman thought he'd surprise Stalin with this announcement that we had just developed an atomic bomb. Of course, he didn't realize that Stalin knew this before he did, actually about a year before he did, but it didn't matter. So basically, um, Henry Stimson's the Secretary of War. He is with Truman at the conference, uh, and he is getting this message operated on this morning. You can read this, diagnose, diagnose, complete, because they didn't know what the actual yield was of the Trinity test until later on. They knew it was a big boom, but they still had some scientific research to do. But results seemed satisfactory, already exceeded expectations. <laughs> Local press release necessary. That's, that's one of those understatements of the century. Like, hey, we just blew up half of New Mexico. Perhaps we should let people know. 
Uh, Dr. Dr. Groves, please. I bet, he, I bet Leslie Groves loved the fact that they called him Dr. Groves. Obviously, you could hold that over the scientist's head. Uh, he'll return tomorrow, I'll keep you posted. So then, later on that day, there's the second one. Doctor, again, Groves is being called Doctor, which he loves, has just returned most enthusiastic and confident that the little boy, there's the phone, the first times we see that being used, is as husky as his big brother. The light in his eyes, discernible from here to high hole, blah, 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 heard a singer to hear five more. Anyway, that is kind of that second message saying they're both going to work really well. And then one of my favorite all time, I've been, if anyone knows where this original telegram is, I will give you anything you want. For put it. So Edward Teller, the first successful test in 1953 of the American hydrogen bomb, had no idea how to announce this back without it getting out to everybody, to send a message back saying it's a boy. Like it was a birth announcement that, that it successfully exploded the first hydrogen bomb sent back, it's a boy. That telegram is somewhere and I want it. Um, for my museum, of course. Um, <laughs> nope. Okay, I'm gonna skip this for sake of time as this kind of takes us in a different direction. Because what I want to do is talk a little bit about what we're dealing with today is the wrong, I can't quite get to today because of obvious reasons, I think. We can talk about throughout a lot of the Cold War how this Manhattan Project counterintelligence was expanded to involve the full gamut of the, the nuclear weapons industry here in the United States. So part of it, we're looking at NTS, the Nevada test site, and the National Test Site here, Department of Energy in a broad way. But also, why do I include Area 51? I'm not talking about little green men, as you know. Nuclear weapons are a system. We're not just talking about the bomb that goes boom. It's the system. It's a system of delivery. It's a system of creation and maintenance and sustainability. The system of even things like psychological testing for those who are involved in nuclear weapons programs. So this broader system had to be protected. So it's not just the bombs or the science that goes behind the bombs. It's understanding that we need to make sure that our Ohio-class nuclear submarines have high levels of counterintelligence protection, security protection, because they're the ones that are providing that one leg of the nuclear triad for us. So you know, there's a, another massive undertaking that still continues to this day. I think people underestimate how much goes into this. I mean, a lot of times we talk about the intelligence community, and the Department of Energy is kind of way down on the list. Because it's, you know, the big boy, it's CIA and NSA and FBI and DIA, and then even like Treasury gets higher because of all the financial crime people and the counterterrorism stuff. And then everyone's like, DOE, what is DOE doing? Well, they're protecting our, our nuclear facilities and our nuclear weapons and everything else, which is huge. You think about, you got the labs themselves, uh, for those that don't know the shorthand, Los Alamos National Lab, Lawrence Liberal National Lab, Sandia, but you also have the production facilities, right? Where they're producing high, highly enriched uranium, where they're producing plutonium, like Oak Ridge, Hanford, the Naval Reactor Program stuff, right? Navy has hundreds of ships that have nuclear reactors in them. All this stuff you combine with the public-private partnership with nuclear power, and you're starting to see the, the huge, huge part of just the creation of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, but then you add in stuff like delivery systems, like when we talk about Ohio-class or Columbia-class submarines or B-52 bombers or B-2 bombers, or you bring in ICBMs, that's the whole space program side of this going back to the 1950s and 1960s. All of these need to be protected against prying eyes from other countries. Collections platforms, these are how we do our intelligence against the other guys, right? So how do we make sure that our satellite systems are protected? Right? Some of the ones that we have like Hexagon and Corona and Gambit, the keyhole satellite systems that are giving us real time eyes down on Russia today or eyes down on the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis that don't exist at that point, kind of do. Or the U-2, which was tested right down the street here. Those are things that we need to protect because that's part of this broad, huge system of nuclear security. Test site security, anyone, there aren't, there aren't a lot of old timers here that used to work at the test site. A couple of you, yes. That was not easy just to waltz on, right? There's a lot of security at the test site because this is a situation in which you could gather a lot of information from watching what was going on at the test site. That still exists today, right? 
And now you have an organization, the NNSA, which some of you are familiar with because they work very closely with the museum here, the National Nuclear Security Agency. It's the NSA with an extra N. All right, so uh, they're extra special because they have two ends. Uh, there's two offices that are rather large. You have nuclear security and nuclear counterintelligence. They're slightly different. All right, one is really more focusing on the um, keeping secret from becoming generally known. That's the security side, right? So you want to make sure that people are not spreading things to the public or spreading things to their wives and girlfriends they're not supposed to. The counterintelligence side of it's a little more formal. This is making sure bad guys from other countries aren't stealing our secrets. So security is kind of more the law enforcement side. Remember we talked about CI and law enforcement are a little different. Security is really that law enforcement side. This is, we're gonna prosecute you if you're spreading some information you're not supposed to to the guy at the, you know, the Walgreens. Uh, you're going to jail for that. The counterintelligence side is, hey, we think that you're passing information back to China. We may watch you for a little while to see who your handlers are. Uh, we may actually try to flip you and work you back against them going the other direction. And that's some of the key difference there. Any questions on this? Because we're going to switch gears dramatically for the last 10 minutes or so. Dramatic switch of gears, so any question before we move on? I, I promised that I would cover, this is what the the, um, the exhibit is that the, the Natural Cryptologic Museum has loaned here to the Atomic Testing Museum, which is around the corner right now. So I just want to give you a little bit of background briefing on what these artifacts are so that when you go look at them in a couple minutes, if you want to, you'll understand a little bit about what we've provided to this museum. And it's a really interesting concept because the, as much as I've talked about us trying to defend our own information from you know, seeping out to other countries. Other countries are doing the same thing. In our main adversary during the Cold War, the Soviet Union was certainly trying to prevent us from finding out how powerful they were, how good their delivery systems were. At first they weren't very good up until basically 1958, so 10 plus years into the Cold War. The only way the Soviets could drop atomic bombs on the United States was a one-way mission over the Arctic. So basically their bombers could fly over the Arctic, they could drop the bombs and then just go down in a blaze of glory. So you're not going to recruit a lot of bomber pilots to do that for you. But of course Sputnik changed all of that, right? The idea of Sputnik was launched into space on a space delivery vehicle that could very easily be turned into an ICBM. So the beginning of the missile race is the 1960s. They didn't want us to know that, right? Sputnik was a surprise because they were very good at protecting that information. The Soviet Union was what we called a hard target in intelligence parlance during the early Cold War. It was very difficult for us to find out anything about what was going on in the Soviet Union. I've already talked a little bit about why. Part of this was human intelligence was non-existent. It was very hard for us to recruit people without them being burned to try to infiltrate the Soviet Union. In fact, the only way we knew where anything was inside the Soviet Union was because of former German POWs that had been released after World War II, and had we debriefed them and they come back and said, hey, our POW camp was right next to an industrial plant that was building X, Y, and Z. Or is the Soviets during World War II moved all of their industry across the Ural Mountains into the Asian side of the Soviet Union and didn't, there's no way to know where it was. We didn't have satellites up there to tell us where it was. So when the Cold War started, Strategic Air Command, so Curtis LeMay and crew, whose job it was to drop atomic bombs on the Soviet Union, came back and said, I don't know where the hell anything is. I don't know where their major, I know where Moscow is, I know where St. Petersburg is, I don't know where their major cities are, I don't know where their industry is, I don't know where their airfields are, I don't know where their nuclear facilities are, nothing. So that's where we were coming, coming from a complete lack of information at this hard target. So how do we know what they're doing? Well, telemetry intelligence, or talent, was a key component of trying to track Soviet technological development during the Cold War period, especially leading up to the missile age of the late 1950s, 1960s. So now it's called Fizant. I don't think anyone, it's technically called Fizant. We still call it Talent at the agency, which is Foreign Instrumentation Signature Intelligence. You can see why they make it Fizant, but no one in hell wants to say foreign and you know, all that nonsense. But this is about delivery systems, right? This isn't about bomb development. This is about getting a bomb on target. Doesn't matter how good our nuclear weapons are or how powerful the Soviet nuclear weapons are, it's can they actually deliver them? 
can they drop them on New York or Chicago or Miami or Las Vegas? And the answer for a long time was no, right? I mean, when they, the Soviets detonated the world's largest nuclear weapon, the Tsar Bomba. It was, by some estimates, about 58 megatons. But it was so damn big, you would need, you know, to put it on an oil tanker and sail it across. I think we'd spot that coming, right? No plane is picking that thing up. So we were like, you made a big bomb, congratulations. Big deal, right? You can't put it on target. And so finding ways to follow delivery systems and understand how they're evolving technologically was a big question for me. NSA became the lead organization for this. You kind of think of NSA as doing communications interception, communications security, but we did, again, what we call ELINT, electronics intelligence. This kind of fell into that ELINT broad spectrum part as part of the ELINT mission. And like I said, there's a response to Sputnik. And then right after Sputnik, they tested what was called the R7. Some of you may be familiar with this. They still use it today. The R7 is basically their launch platform that they put stuff at the International Space Station and everything else. They, they didn't mess around with kind of creating any things with bells and whistles. They're literally still using the same rocket system they used in 1959 to put stuff into space. So our solution was to create a program called Hardball. Hardball is not an acronym. It's just a very kind of neat way of creating. The Department of Defense just came up with a fun code name and it was Hardball. Uh, it could have something to do. There is there is scuttlebutt and rumor that someone took one look at the Anders Station radar and said, that looks like a baseball, let's call it hardball. That's not confirmed. I don't believe that's true. I believe that was just next on the list of DOD code names, which is kind of how you get a lot of these. So hardball is from the 1960s. Uh, Anders Station, anyone, know, anyone been to Shemya Island in Alaska? You're lucky you haven't. We're talking about the middle of nowhere. Uh, but it was a great way to, to basically eavesdrop on what the Soviets were doing, partially because um, it was nowhere near any other kind of electromagnetic interference that would have been, uh, that would cause kind of a signal interruption, but also because while the Soviets were launching a lot of their weapons tests and missile tests from the middle of the Soviet Union, which is impossible to watch without satellites and spy planes, the landing site was the Kamchatka Peninsula, which if you played risk, or anything else you know is all the way on the far end of the Asian continent, right across from Alaska. So this had a perfect bird's eye view of what was landing uh, in, that, in that peninsula. Um, and all that came to the, the National, eventually, Telemetry Processing Center in the mid-1950s, which is the analysis side of the picture. So this is the collection side. So this is pulling in the data, all the data that they're getting. And then the Risman system, which is actually the one in the other room, uh, is doing the analysis side. This is what's crunching the numbers. This is what's trying to understand the broader intelligence picture because they're asking these names. Now, here's the quiz of the day. What is that picture representing? Anyone? No, I know it's from what movie it's from, but why did I pick it for this? This is the, none of you have grandkids or kids that love Frozen 2? What's this, what's this song from Frozen 2? Now, let it go from the first one. What's from the second one? Oh, come on, really? I had to look this up, too. It's the unknown. Yeah, right? Okay, everyone's, oh, right? These are the unknowns. There's no knowns and no no knowns. These are really the unknowns. All these questions are what we're trying to figure out when we're looking at Soviet missile development, weapons development. So it's not just, how does this missile work? It's, it's big issues, right? Propulsion systems, power, fuel composition. We're talking about solid fuel versus liquid fuel. How reliable are they? Are they blowing up like ours are? Because ours are blowing up all over the place. Are theirs going to blow up? We don't have to worry about being nuked by the Soviets if their missiles don't work. So we're trying to ask these questions. A question, that, uh, how much weight can they lift? This is a fancy term called throw weight, which we're really obsessed with throw weight. I don't know why, uh, because we created these very light, very accurate missiles that you didn't need a huge missile to do, uh, but we cared about them. Range, this is really important, right? Can they come and get us? Or where do they have to be deployed to actually be able to come and get us? Guidance system, they're using inertial guidance. Are they using guidance like, um, our systems were evolving very quickly about guidance systems. Why does accuracy matter? 
Anyone have the answer to that question? Well, you laugh. It's nuclear weapons, though. Why does accuracy matter when you're talking about nuclear weapons? It's not a, I'm not, not making a funny a joke here, right? The Soviets didn't care about accuracy. Not one, but they cared, but they didn't focus a lot on it. We did, right? Why do you want accurate nuclear weapons? All right, let's walk through this, because I think this is a fun question. If you're retaliating for a nuclear strike, right? Let's say the, the Americans, uh, you, the Soviets invade over across the Fulda Gap in Germany. NATO, as we know now, kicks the crap out of the Soviet conventional forces, because the Russians, and the, the, their equipment is garbage. And so the Soviets go, oh my god, we're about to lose this war. Let's make it go nuclear. They fire some not tactical nuclear weapons, which they don't consider to be a first strike, right? They're dropping tactical nuclear weapons on military formations. We do consider that. So we respond with a strategic nuclear exchange, hit St. Petersburg, or in this case, Leningrad, Moscow, Stalingrad, a couple other places. They launch everything they've got. This is the scenario a lot of you grew up with, like we grew up with in the Cold War. The idea of all of a sudden you got a full nuclear war. At that point, accuracy doesn't matter all that much, right? Because you're launching hundreds of missiles. You're not launching your missiles at what we call counterforce targets. It's a counterforce target. The other, the other guy's nukes, right? So you're not launching a counterforce operation because the other guy's nukes have already been launched. You're launching at cities. You're launching at population centers or airfields or at other places. You don't care, it doesn't really matter, it's the whole idea of if you land on one block or another in the middle of Chicago, it's still going to take Chicago out, right? So accuracy really doesn't make a difference. When does it make a difference? We're trying to hit a nuclear silo that's the size of basically me from thousands of miles away when you're firing a missile flying at thousands of miles an hour in a re revolving Earth, trying to land it right on top of the silo. Now. What do you assume is still there? The missile's still there inside the silo, which means what? Bring it on home. Well, you're, take it to that next level. Well, you get it before it gets us, which means what are you doing? Do I hear a first strike from anyone out there? All right, that means you're actually launching first. Because if you're launching second, if you're doing retaliatory launch, those missiles aren't there anymore. So we can learn a lot, actually, about things like guidance systems and accuracy. You can learn a lot about strategy, right? Because if the strategy is to reserve the right to have a nuclear first strike, then you're going to have insanely accurate missiles, right? That's why we really focus on accuracy, right? All the you know, desert storm, all the scenes of us dropping a smart bomb down an elevator shaft. Well, that was so we could drop nukes down the Kremlin elevator shaft, because accuracy mattered. The, the Russians didn't give a crap about accuracy, because they assumed it was going to be a retaliatory strike. So did everybody else. There's one country on Earth that still reserves the right to have a nuclear first strike. Us, right? So by understanding things like guidance systems, understanding how accurate their weapons are, we can understand their strategy. We can understand how they're going to face things, nuclear weapons. Flight profiles, same idea. Right? How quickly are these things coming across? Are they attempting to be decapitation, decapitation strikes? Right? Or do we worry about keeping the president alive? Right? A lot of this, the systems we've designed from Air Force One to what's called the Deep Underground Command Centers to Raven Rock up in Pennsylvania to the you know, separate spots for Congress like under Camp David were all designed based on our telemetry intelligence understanding the designs of Soviet missile systems and weapons that were going to be fielded and how long they were going to take before they hit us in the United States. And then some of the other things, development of problems, how fast is the pace, and all these other things come into play. Now, where it really comes to a head and where some of the artifacts that we've given really play a role is in compliance. Because telemetry can tell us a lot of information about whether or not they're cheating on some of these very important treaties that no longer matter because Putin says the hell with it. We're gonna kind of go do our own thing. But for a long time, we had some very important treaties. The first one was SALT-1, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, which in this case, the, you know, more formally the interim agreement, this had a telemetry aspect to it 
that said that that's how we were going to understand if people were complying. If they weren't cheating, we were going to allow each other to have essentially unfettered telemetry access to all of our testing that we're doing to make sure we're not cheating. And then SALT 2 kind of reinforces this idea, which even leads us to the START Treaty, the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks, which actually has a, what's called a telemetry protocol written into it, that we were going to trade back and forth our telemetry data on these big magnetic tape reels that would show us how our weapon systems are doing. So we were sharing information about how powerful our, our weapons were, about how good our rockets were, about how the, everything from their arc to their throw weight to all these questions that we had were asking back in the 50s and 60s, all of a sudden we're just handing that information over to the Russians and they're handing that information back to us so that we can understand that we can know that they're complying with these treaty obligations. And this really focused on this idea of reduction of both ICBMs and submarine launched ballistic missiles. That's what an SLBM is. Because you can't really cheat on these treaties if you've got active telemetry systems, because we're going to spot them. We're going to see them and we're going to pull the intelligence from them. So these were very, very important during this time period. And so the the compliance stuff that you're seeing here is a big part of what the machines are in the other room uh, that are part of this exhibit. Um, one you'll see that actually has Russian writing all over it. This was their telemetry data processing center that NSA got at the end of the Cold War because we traded with the Russians for their information. Does that make sense? Any questions about anything? Yes, ma'am. So it is and it isn't. Um, this is where this is where there's not the opinion of the National Security Agency. There's a lot of arguments that are coming up because of this leak. One is, are there way too many people that have top secret clearance? What was the Air Force National Guard guy uh, doing with top secret clearance? Well, it's because he actually worked in a in a, an intelligence field doing cyber work. So yeah, he's got access to a lot of things. What did he release? Is the question. Some of it was problematic. Some of it was information that certainly helps our adversaries. He's going to spend a long time in prison because it's one thing just to release information. It's another thing to release information that you can clearly point to having an impact on our allies' ability to defend themselves and on our adversaries' ability to cause trouble. For, I'm being very vague here for obvious reasons. The trouble that I think is unique to this one, I think we, people are going to study it more than they have some of the other ones, is that we know for a fact that some of the information that is now out there online has been tampered with. So he released all this stuff on these, these chat rooms and he was buddies trying to impress these kids playing video games. It's a weird story. But we know for a fact that certainly the Russians got their hands on some of the kill data in Ukraine and other things and actually tampered with it uh, and changed the information on it before it was widely released online. Uh, there's a casualty list that the Russians actually reversed everything and it made it look like the Ukrainians had uh, suffered more casualties than the Russians did when it was reversed. And that's the trouble we're going to run into late now where you see information that's released and is it act, is it real? Is it something that is going to be um, a problem, and, and usually you say yes, it's a problem is you're releasing information that you don't want people to have. Now we're adding in the problem, it's, it's, it's a problem because it's wrong. And so uh, you're not just using it as a weapon to screw over a country because you're giving away their secrets, you're actually using it as a weapon because you've, you've uh, altered the information and you're using it as disinformation as we've seen now for the last 10 years or so uh, to um, try to change public opinion about something. I mean, this, they're changing this information and directing it toward their own public, right? The Russians are trying to make it look like the Ukrainians are losing a lot more people than they are, so their public, the Russian public, will see it and go, oh, we're winning the war. That's the audience, right? It's not the Americans. We see every day that the Russians are getting their behinds handed to them on a daily basis. But the Russian public needs to be kind of reassured that they're winning the war 
And so they took this information that was leaked by an American, not for any reason to help the Russians, but the Russians took it and said, hey, we can use this stuff, let's change it, and then re-release it so that it gained some traction. So we're seeing kind of a, almost a dual-headed monster there uh, where it's not just a traditional, oh God, they released information that we wanted to keep secret, but there's information out there that had now been manipulated to be used as a weapon against us. He's not gonna see the light of day for a long time. Um, this is not the time to be releasing information that is pro-Russia. Uh, I don't know how many juries are gonna be very happy with that. Um, plus, he's just trying to impress some kids, which is really dumb, dumb reason, I mean, to, to commit espionage. So, any other questions? Yes? There's not a lot, um, mainly because of anyone who was in the field is still obligated not to talk about a lot of that. Um, you would think the sources and methods that we use today are very different, but they're not. Um, and so there's a very, it's very difficult to write about anything and release anything that is even remotely uh, part of any of our lifetimes. That's why we're starting to start, starting to see stuff from the 40s and the 50s being released. I mean, when I was doing my research uh, for my dissertation, which turned into a book later on, I couldn't get a letter from 1945 uh, that Harold Urry, actually, who discovered heavy water, wrote. And it was essentially, I understand, because basically it was how much, how much plutonium do we need to make the plutonium bomb? And that's good that we're keeping that secret. There are 50 other people who have written about that letter. So I know exactly what it says, but I've never seen the letter. And I'm, I understand why they're still keeping it classified. It's probably not something you want to get into somebody's hands because it's really technically detailed, right? It's like, you need this much uranium if you're gonna use this kind of a bomb, this much if you're gonna do that plutonium here, and like, good, keep that classified. The trouble, basically, if it's not the corona hexcon gambit generation, you're getting a little bit about some of the more keyhole side stuff because, so here's the difference. So basically, the first three satellites that were created will all use film, like old, you, I have an audience, I, usually I'm talking to younger people. I have an audience that understands film, right? Film, click, click, film. Um, and they're in satellites, and so how do you get the film back from satellites? Well, they drop them in these buckets through the atmosphere that were picked up by these planes. They went and they developed the film, same way they did with like U2s and other things like that. Those first three satellites were the last ones to use film. I think the last hexagon was launched by the space shuttle in like 82 or 83. And at that point, we moved on to real time. So talking about digital, to where you're just beaming down a signal from space or digital photographs. That's the kind of cutoff point to getting any real information uh, as far as unclassified information with anything overhead reconnaissance. Even when you're talking about like U2, um, it's tricky to get declassified information. A lot of what you're getting are from like Roadrunners or from the people like T.D. Barnes and others who are around here that are releasing information from their careers and from their lives. Um, I think the official Lockheed history, like 80% of it's classified. And that's from like 50s and 60s. Uh, so it's tricky. It's, it's, I wish there was something better. There really isn't. I mean, if you want to get into some of the really interesting overhead reconnaissance inside baseball stuff, go to the analysts. So like the anal analytical side, like Dino Brugioni, who was the chief of NPIC, the National Photographic Interpretations Center, uh, he was the guy who discovered the missiles during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he worked all the way into like his retirement in like 1980 or whatever. And he wrote a bunch of books where he talks about that level of things. But it's all unclassified, and so you don't really get into the stuff that you really want to get into. But yeah, it's 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 hard to get updated versions of a lot of things. No, I mean if it's been published, you're fine. I mean, you know, it, it's. There are articles being written. One of the things that you can probably, especially if, you've, if you're through a university, is go and look at some of the intelligence journals uh, because there are shorter form articles being written that are a little bit more, it takes years to publish a book, especially when you're talking about going through the pre-pub process and all that stuff. Articles can get knocked out in six months. You can get stuff that has the latest declassified information in it from a journal article versus from a book because it's just the time is much, much shorter to get that published. Uh, yes, sir? Mine's a wider question. I can't quite read the K 
caption on the little cartoon. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. I can't quite read yeah. the question. All right. So this is the all-time classic, of course. Screw the limit. All far side. So this, I think we actually were joking about this the other day. So there, you've got the nukes going off. You've got the, the fallout shelter. It says, how many times did I say it, Harold? How many times? Make sure that bomb shelter's got a can opener. Ain't much good without a can opener, I said. <laughs> so... That's like the whole jugs without the water in them kind of thing. And then this one is one of the all-time greatest. So um, it's wonderful that Farsight is coming back now. And he came out of retirement because, well, because the world has gotten a little wacky. So he's got a target-rich environment to make fun of stuff. So uh, any other questions? We do have a question on Zoom. Um, given that the Russians have abandoned the various treaty obligations, does it make sense to restart nuclear testing? No, I, so I don't, if I've listened to people correctly here at this museum and other places, it's not necessary. It seems like the stockpile stewardship program when it comes to the subcrit work being done out at the test site is enough to let us, the, the reason to test is to make sure your stuff works, right? Because, you know, mutual assured destruction deterrence doesn't work if you don't know if your bombs are going to go off. The idea of what keeps us safe is the knowledge that if we start World War III, everyone dies. And that doesn't work if you're not 100% sure and if your adversary is not 100% sure that your nukes are going to work. There's some very disturbing, I'm taking this in a tangent, sort of, there's some very disturbing talk among pundits who don't know what the hell they're talking about, saying like, well, we're looking at how bad Russian equipment is in Ukraine, like their tanks don't work, I bet their nukes don't even work. So why are we afraid of this? Like, time out, right? That's mirror imaging, right? The mirror imaging part of that is saying, because their tanks don't work, their nukes don't work, because in the United States, we give money to all of our nuclear weapons complex and our conventional. Right? The, the Pentagon budget is hundreds of billions of dollars, and that's spread evenly to everybody. That's a stupid thing to assume other countries are the same. The Russians have spent ridiculous amounts of money maintaining their nuclear weapons. Not so much their tanks, not so much training their troops, right? But their bombers, their strategic submarines, their ICBMs, yeah, they got the money. So it'd be really stupid to assume that because a Russian T-64 built in 1955 gets blown up by a Ukrainian kid with a, an American-made multi-million dollar shoulder-fired rocket built last year means that their nukes don't work. That's a really dumb idea. So the question is, can we make sure that if we, God forbid, have to launch a nuclear weapon at somebody, it's going to go off the way we intend it to? If we can do that without testing, then we shouldn't, because of environmental considerations, because of it sends a really bad message to the rest of the world, let the Russians be the assholes, excuse my French, Right? Let them break the rules, let them be the pariahs. If we can do it without testing, which we have now since when was the moratorium? 63, that was the atmospheric one, the conventional test ban treaty after the Cuban Missile Crisis. If we can do it effectively without testing, we should keep doing it without testing. Plus, here's the great part about it. How many of you know from newspapers or from the news how effective and how advanced our nuclear weapons are? The answer should be none of you. Because we can keep that stuff secret if we're doing it underground, if we're doing subcritical tests, if it's just math, if all these things can be secret. If you test in the middle of the Nevada desert, that's not secret, right? You can't keep that quiet. Even underground testing, you can't keep that quiet. But all the data that is brought in from these subcritical tests or from the stockpile shooters program, all that data can be kept classified so that we know about it and no one else does. So there's an advantage to not testing. There's testing you can't keep quiet. Yeah. Anything else? All right. I appreciate you guys coming out. And um, if you want, I kind of can wander in there. I mean, the, the labels inside that space actually tell you what the stuff is, and I've given you an explanation for it. But I can answer any questions that you might have once you've wandered over there. All right. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming out. We hope you 
drive home safe and if you are interested we have another lecture coming up in May more details will be on our website for that um, within the next few days but thank you so much for coming out again uh, Vince thank you again this was great and take care everyone good night <laughs>